Okay, and your live. Hi, welcome to Friday's live feed from Gulf Specimen Marine Lab and Aquarium here in Panacea, Florida. And today we're going to tackle a question that we get asked here all the time. Uh, and that's how to become a marine biologist. So if you want to be a marine biologist, or you want to change careers, or you thought as a youth that you would like to become a marine biologist, get out your paper and pencil and take some of this information down. Now, I have to I have to give a disclaimer right off the bat. I got um, we we talked about doing this live feed and this topic uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I found online a set of videos from a woman named Melanie Knight, who is an aquarium founder in Canada and runs a tiny little aquarium called the Petty Harbor Mini Aquarium in Nova Scotia. And she has done a number of uh, videos about becoming a marine biologist and she gave me the idea to do 10, uh, 10 things that you should concentrate on in order to become a marine biologist. So when we're done and you've watched this live feed, go back to YouTube and punch in Melanie Knight how to become a marine biologist and uh, you can follow up with some of her suggestions which will not be identical to the ones that we're covering here so some of that will be new information and um, she does things in a slightly different order than I'm going to do but I wanted to give her credit because she did an excellent job and you should really check out her YouTube videos but the number one thing that people ask us about becoming a marine biologist is what should I do in school? What kind of school should I go to? What should I take in school? And I want to just reassure those of you who may have uh, gone to school and done something different that not every marine biologist starts out as a marine biologist. There are many, many paths to this career. And I myself, when I, uh, uh, I, I'm gonna give you some tips for high school, college, graduate school, and then perhaps PhD work. Um, but when I was in high school, I, I grew up in Colorado. I never once thought about becoming a marine biologist. I had never been to the ocean, and uh, it was a real foreign environment to me. So uh, what I did know was that I was interested in nature and uh, biology, and uh, they had a really good biology curriculum where I went to high school, and so I got a really sound uh, background in that. And for those of you who are in high school, or those of you who have high school students who want to go into marine biology, while people are in high school, the things you need to remember is keep your, all your options open. Take math, take science, take some writing classes, because you're going to have to write papers, and you're also going to want to communicate what you've learned uh, to other people. Uh, secondly, while you're in high school, I want you to start developing your ocean literacy. And uh, I'm going to show you this little chart, okay? But marine educators, people who teach people about the ocean, have uh, set up a set of things that everybody should know about the ocean, whether or not you intend to be a marine biologist whether you just want to be a good citizen. And there are seven major points to ocean literacy. And if you just plug into Google, ocean literacy, it will take you to this wonderful site that will go over those seven questions, tell you how you can increase your knowledge in each of those areas. And you can even take a little test to see what your ocean literacy score is right now and you can repeat that test over and over to see whether or not your knowledge is growing over time. 
So this is a really important site in helping you um, self-educate, which is going to be very important uh, in any, anyone's career, because even when you get out of college, you're probably going to end up doing something that you didn't necessarily learn in school. And so learning to self-educate is really important. Okay, after you graduate from high school, you are, of course, going to start looking to go to colleges. And I have two suggestions. Number one, I suggest to everybody that they go to a community college first. Get those first two years out of the way at a school that's close to you and affordable. And at a community college, the instructors, that's what they do. They are not involved in lots of research. They are really, really educators and they really want you to get the basics. So for math, science, humanities, social sciences, all of those courses that you need to become a college graduate and that they have you do in your freshman and sophomore year, I would advise taking those at a community college where it's affordable and where it's close to you. Now, once you're ready for your upper level classes, okay, your junior and senior year, where you're gonna go to some four-year university, uh, I suggest that you pick between five and 10 schools, send off your information, talk to people, pick people on their website that you can email directly, like the head of the zoology department, the head of oceanography, the guidance counselor for sciences, and start to really research those schools, but limit that so that you're not just, you know, going willy-nilly to 20 or 30 different schools. The other thing is to keep in mind that there are a lot of schools that don't have a marine biology major, and so that's okay. For your bachelor's degree, you can get marine biology, you can get oceanography, you can get environmental science, you can get environmental policy, you can get zoology, you can get just biology, you can get botany, any of those basic science disciplines that are going to relate to ocean science will give you a really sound background. And then with your bachelor's degree, if you want to go to work with a bachelor's degree, there are a number of places that hire people who have a bachelor's degree in those areas that are looking at uh, marine science and marine biology. Aquariums hire people with, with their bachelors. A lot of research facilities hire technicians who have their bachelors. Um, a lot of fisheries scientist positions begin with people who just have their bachelors. So um, there's a, quite a bit that you can do and anytime you get one of those jobs, what you need to remember is think about what you like about the job and what you don't like about the job. And then when you go to look for a new job or look for more training, think about, okay, what kind of things involve those things that I really like and what involve those things that I really don't like. Like, you might not like public speaking. So, you know, you may not want to apply for jobs in the education department at the aquarium because you're, you did that at a summer camp and you had to do all these uh, public speaking things, tours, etc., and you hated it. Okay, look to match what you really like from your work experience with things that you don't like and then you can kind of narrow down what it is you're gonna do. Okay, now, uh, if you wanna go ahead and get a master's degree in um, something that relates to marine science, once again, there are a lot of schools that don't necessarily have a degree in marine science, but they may offer a lot of coursework in marine life and oceanography and 
invertebrates and fishes and uh, so your what's on your um, diploma may not necessarily say marine biology but it will have a lot of relevance when it comes to putting you in the uh, job field. Okay, now when you're looking for schools to go to for your graduate work, uh, you want to look to see what schools are doing and what their areas of research and expertise are. Are there professors involved with offshore work, doing things, um, you know, on big boats offshore, maybe in several countries, uh, do submersibles, that kind of thing, or do they work inshore, do they specialize in invertebrates, uh, do they have a faculty that is strong in environmental policy. So kind of look at those graduate schools and see what their faculty members are doing and what their strengths are and kind of match that to what it is that you want to do. And uh, that way you'll get coursework that it really targets what it is you want to do with the rest of your life. And um, once you've got that degree, there are many research tech positions, many fisheries tech positions, many aquarium positions, um, many ocean research centers uh, have positions for people with their master's degree. And uh, the pay is usually quite a bit better than it is for people with their bachelor's degree. And you'll still be doing um, a lot of work either in the lab or in the field usually. And so if that's what you wanna do is do the work and go into the field uh, or set up the um, research design, that kind of thing, and uh, the master's degree is probably where you want to go. If you are interested in teaching at a four-year university or if you want to do marine science research, you need to get your PhD. And when, after you finish your master's, you want to start looking at people that you want to work with who are doing things in the field that you want to be involved in, the research specialty that you want to be involved in. And then you want to apply to those schools for your PhD work. Okay, that's number one, going to school. You, you, I, I wish I could tell you you could be a marine biologist without having to go to any school. And there are a couple people who've done that. Our founder right here at Bell Specimen doesn't have anything behind, but besides his high school diploma, but he had to work really hard to make the connections that would allow him to do what he's uh, been able to do in his field. And he, he really has done an exceptional job of taking what he was um, good at and, and making it uh, into a career. Okay, number two. I want to talk about books because this is something you can do regardless of your level of education. There are lots and lots of books out there and uh, let me suggest some way to approach books that will help you learn about marine science. Number one, look at some textbooks. Okay, this is like just a standard oceanography textbook and uh, those of you who who uh, are not in school may not know that uh, biological oceanography is basically the same as marine biology. You're studying the living things that are found in the ocean, but you probably, taking a, an oceanography major, would get a better background in uh, water chemistry and geology and those things. But look through the textbooks and see what it is. What kind of graphs are they using? What are the topics? What are the chapter headings? What is it that you're going to be studying when you enter this field? Uh, this is a college textbook. This is um, a textbook that's used in a lot of high schools uh, in marine science classes. And so once again, it will give you some idea of the kind of things that you 
would be involved in in studying marine science. And so that's just kind of a basic. And um, I, I always recommend going on Amazon to use books and stuff if you find a book that you really want, rather than, particularly textbooks are very expensive. Before you, you know, shell out $300 for the textbook, go on Amazon and see what they've got. Okay, another uh, set of books that's really important to our field guides and trade books. I'm going to start with field guides. These are things that usually target one kind of uh, organism. For instance, this is a shell field guide. Okay, so when you're collecting shells on the beach and you want to know about the things that created those shells, this book gives you lots and lots of information. And uh, usually the introduction to these field guides gives you a ton of information about the group. So having a good set of field guides is really important. I've got, I've got one for seashells, I've got one for fishes, I've got one for um, aquatic plants and algae, I have some for invertebrates. Um, I, here's one I'm gonna show you, this is uh, one for Florida, the living beaches of Florida, and this is just, it has great pictures of just virtually anything you might find on the beach, from seashells to other things that wash up, and uh, gives you a pretty good deal of information about them, so that you can look them up further if you want to. And here's another of my favorites. This one's falling apart because I've used it so much, but this is a field guide to the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. And once again, it's uh, divided into uh, parts. It's got a part of, on fishes, it has a part on sponges, it has a part on algae, and so, um, and it's got great color photographs in the uh, center of the book so that you can take your specimen and see if you can find it and find out more information. Now, trade books are things that are um, neither textbooks nor field guides, but may address things um, about the ocean. And I'm going to show you my favorite trade book. I recommend it to all of our volunteers here and to many other people, teachers. I recommend it all the time. This is a trade book that was put out in the 1980s. It's called The Seaside Naturalist. And uh, it's, it's got chapters on sponges, chapters on fish, chapters on whales. And it's very, very easy to read. That's why I recommend it all the time. It's, the reading is just very, very easy. There's lots of illustration. Every page is divided into about half text and half illustration. So um, it, it makes it easy to read and um, you don't have to read it all at once. You can read it in little sections. And so this is one of my favorite trade books about the ocean. And then, I get real excited now, you, you want to read some marine science classics. Classic books about the ocean that have been around for a long time. Okay. Here are some of my favorites. Rachel Carson, who many of you may know as the author of The Silent Spring, who warned us about the dangers of DDT and actually her book led to banning that pesticide that was killing off birds around the world. So very, very important in the environmental movement. But Rachel Carson was a marine biologist and her first books were about the ocean. And they were, she has three books out that were all bestsellers way before Silent Spring. This one that's called The Edge of the Sea uh, talks about the Atlantic coast of the United States. It starts up in Maine and uh, there are five chapters. Uh, the Maine, New England chapter is chapter one and it goes all the way down to South Florida and the Everglades and the Keys and talks about our coastline. The uh, other two are The Sea Around Us, 
which uh, talks about the ocean in general, and uh, this one under sea and wind, uh, all of which have lots of great stories. She's just an excellent writer about things that live in the ocean, from eels to uh, trout and salmon. It's just very, very interesting reading because she's a really good author. So some of those classics, you should pay attention to. And here's another of my favorites. It's called The Open Sea. And uh, this is about offshore lives. This doesn't have any coastal uh, stuff in it. This is really about uh, open sea environments. And um, it's a real old book, but it's, uh, it's just excellent and um, there aren't many books about the open sea so that's a real goodie okay and then uh, just look for books that might inspire you to learn more about the ocean and I'm going to give you some examples one of my favorites is biographies there's a great biography out um, about Bob Ballard who is the um, scientist who found the Titanic and he worked many, many years at Woods Hole. Uh, this is another biography. This is one of my favorites. This is Eugenie Clark. Eugenie Clark was a shark biologist. She started Moat Marine Lab here in the state of Florida. Uh, she ended up her career teaching at the University of Maryland. Um, she was the ichthyology professor, so she taught all about fishes. But as a young woman, she um, spent time spear diving in the South Pacific and collecting organisms. They are just fish of many, many sorts. And so, um, particularly for young women who are, who are looking for inspiration in the fields of marine science, this is a great little book. And once again, it's short, it's easy to read, and it's real fun. Okay, now, um, Sylvia Earle uh, was the, na the nation's marine biologist for many, many years uh, under Clinton and somewhat under Bush, etc. And she's just an amazing uh, speaker and author. So this book called Sea Change is about oceans. She has two or three others that are also very inspirational and uh, she has one of the best known TED Talks. So for those of you who like a good TED Talk, uh, which is all about the ocean and the importance of oceans, um, then this is a, a really good volume. Okay, here's a little book that I um, I loved. This uh, book is called Water Baby, and it's all about a research submersible called Alvin. That is uh, the research submersible for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, HUI, one of our nation's premier me uh, marine labs, but. Uh, they were the only ones that had a submersible for many, many years that was affiliated with the United States. So if you were going to do anything like below 200 feet, you needed a good submersible or submarine. And uh, Alvin has been reconfigured many times, gone on many, many, many expeditions. And this book talks about the expeditions that um, have taken place uh, involving that submersible. Here's another one that uh, is kind of interesting. This is The Search Beneath the Sea. This is a book about the search for um, the coelacanth. In the 1950s, a, uh, a scientist was given a fish that at that point in time to the scientific community was known only as a fossil, and this was a live specimen. It's called the coelacanth, and it was an example of lobe-finned fishes. 
the group of fishes that gave rise to amphibians. So it was very important as far as the history of vertebrates on the planet. And this is, it took another 20 years before they got another specimen and were able to find out where these fish were living um, and were not just fossil examples in the world's oceans. So this one is really kind of fun. And then I wanted to highlight some of um, our founder's books, which are the reason I came to Gulf Specimen to begin with. Uh, our founder is a gentleman named Jack Redlow who began a marine specimen company way back in the late 50s, early 60s. And um, he wrote a fan letter to John Steinbeck when he was in his youth. And uh, Mr. Steinbeck not only um, responded to his letter, but really encouraged him in his early years to pursue both becoming a marine biologist and to pursue becoming a writer because he had interest in both of those things. And uh, that, that really helped set him on a career path where um, he really has made a difference in uh, conservation here in the Northern Gulf Coast area. Uh, his first book, is actually the sea brings forth and it's about collecting marine specimens right around here another important book this is where i first became introduced to jack redlow is the erotic ocean i saw jack on the today show way back i want to say in the 70s okay might have been in the 80s but i think it was in the 70s and uh he was promoting this particular book, which is also about collecting uh, marine specimens in and around the northern Gulf Coast and some of the adventures that he encountered in, in collecting those. And the whole back section of the book uh, kind of breaks those organisms down into groups and, and talks about them. And then uh, this book, The Living Dock, uh, talks about collecting things that grow on docks and pilings and the bottom of boats and that whole community of organisms that need something hard to sit down on and um, we don't have much of that in the Gulf but a dock will provide that and that kind of details this book details that community and does so in a very, very entertaining way. Okay, so point number one, stay in school, know about the schools you wanna to go to as much as possible. Number two, read as many books as you can about marine science, and we've tried to give you some ideas there. Number three, volunteer. Volunteer so that you um, get several things. You will get experience in the field of marine science. You will get opportunities to see and learn a great deal that you might not find anywhere else. You will meet some great people, many of whom are much more knowledgeable than you are in the field of marine science, and they can help you out. And you'll make a difference. Usually those places that need volunteers are places that are trying to uh, better our world in some way or other. So please know that um, you will get this really warm feeling about being able to make a difference. And um, finally, studies have shown that volunteers uh, relieve stress while they're at their volunteer job and that their health increases and improves due to their volunteerism and there's quite a big body of scientific evidence that indicates that that is the case 
Not to mention the fact that you'll have fun, usually, if you're volunteering. Sometimes it'll be a lot of work, but most of the time you'll be learning, and so it'll be, it'll be really fun. Let me give you some ideas of where you might volunteer um, if you're interested in marine science. Aquariums are always a good place. Dive shops are a good place. University labs are a good place. Rescue facilities are a good place. And parks, national, state, and county parks, and preserves are also really good places where you can volunteer, you can learn a lot, and you'll get some real work experience towards your goals in marine science. So that's number three. Number four, you should start looking for mentors and develop a plan for getting people who can help you further your goals in marine education. Make a list of those people that you've met, those people you've heard about, those people that you've encountered on social media, those people who are uh, you ran into in some Google article, okay? Make a list of those people who you think can help you out, okay, in your goal of becoming a marine biologist so that you don't have to give up on it, okay? So once you have your list, you want to approach those people and uh, see if you can have a 30 minute phone conversation with them. And you wanna prepare for that phone conversation by preparing a number of questions that you wanna ask them. If at the end of that 30 minutes, you feel really good about that person, you feel connected with that person, then that might be a good person to officially ask to be your mentor. Now, here's the key to a mentor. You must respect their time and their responsibilities. Okay, so you want their help, but you don't want to just eat their life, okay, by asking stuff, you know, a, a bunch of different times. So. What you wanna do is you wanna have some specific goal in mind when you approach a mentor. Like you want to uh, ease the transition of going from your bachelor's degree to graduate school. And you want some advice on getting into good graduate schools that will mesh with your skills. And uh, put a time frame on it, say, you know, can you work with me for five months? That's how long I've got to get all of these applications in and get them ready. Can we meet on Skype once a month? Okay, and that sets down some parameters and that, uh, that way you have a committed mentor if they agree to that and you're not wasting your mentor's time. You really have, you need to work at developing that so that you get the information that you need for each little stage as you go through your career uh, development. And then number five, we're just gonna go through five today. <laughs> Next Friday, we'll go through six through 10. Number five, immerse yourself, get wet. <laughs> you have got to spend time in the water. If you can't swim, learn to swim. That's your first goal, okay? You have got to become a competent swimmer. Second, learn to snorkel. Buy yourself a good face mask, a good snorkel so that you are comfortable in the water. Take an introductory snorkeling class and then carry that mask and snorkel with you in the back of the car all the time. Whenever you encounter a good place that you think might be a good place to snorkel, along with a buddy, of course, okay, then you're prepared uh, to do that. 
the more time you spend in the water, the better off you're going to be. My biggest, uh, the thing that made me the best marine biologist that I could be is that I did an internship in the Keys and then I worked at that location for another two years where I spent about six hours a day in the water. I, I guarantee you, I saw a tremendous amount of marine life and that exposure is what really uh, piqued my interest, kept me going, and uh, made me a much more competent marine biologist than those people who don't have that kind of background. So uh, get yourself a snorkel and a mask and start spending some time in the water. Go through a scuba class, okay? I'm not a big scuba fan. If I can snorkel, over scuba, I will do it every time. <laughs> but there are some things that if you want to see them, you need to use scuba, okay? Many people really like the challenge of scuba. It's a little more dangerous. It's a little more involved, but it's a useful, useful skill and tool if you're going to be a marine biologist. So take the time and get, a, get certified as a, a scuba um, certified. I mean, you don't have to be a master scuba person or have 99 different certifications, but um, it's a skill that for many of you, you're, you're going to, that's gonna be an important part of what you envision for your life as a marine biologist. Um, next, get some boating experience. Okay, that was really hard for me, I gotta tell you. I, I grew up in Colorado. We, I barely saw a boat when I was growing up. There were a few people who had boats for lakes, but most of the rivers were really fast and shallow and you couldn't really take a, rip, a boat on those. So getting some boating experience for me was really tough. So when I was finishing up my master's degree, I made the decision that I would do an internship somewhere where I would be using a boat. And I got really lucky and I used a boat practically every day that I worked uh, for that internship and then for the two years that I worked afterwards. And uh, that boating experience made a tremendous amount of difference in what I was able to do in jobs then in the future. And then, you, if you can't do those things, which you can't do those things all the time, then go to the beach, wade, wade the beach at night, go hunt through the tide pools. I even have this little area here in North Florida where we've never, hardly ever even heard of a tide pool, but it's where an old house was and where the sea walls collapsed and has created all these little pools. And I try and go there every couple of weeks and take a look at what is in those little pool areas. So um, make sure that you try and get exposure to marine areas as much as you possibly can. Look at all those things that you find on the beach. Try and make sure that you know what they are. Pay attention when you're out in the boat to what you're seeing and what you're catching. If you're fishing, all of those things are going to make you a better marine biologist. So we're done with one through five. Let me go through them again. Number one, going to school. We went through several things from high school all the way to your PhD. Read books because that will give you a ton of information. If you're not good at reading, get them on Audible. And uh, you know, on your way back and forth to school or your way back and forth to work, um, listen to those books. Number three, volunteer, do an internship, whatever, to get yourself some experience, to see uh, new things, to get you some opportunities that will increase your knowledge and your skills. And uh, 
in addition to that, it'll, it'll help you out health-wise. Okay, uh, develop a mentor. Think about who you might uh, want to serve as a mentor. It doesn't have to be a lifelong thing. You may have several mentors over your career, uh, each of which has, has helped you uh, meet another goal or requirement. And then finally, get wet. Get in the water. There is no substitute for that. Okay, I'm hoping you guys were writing things down and I'm hoping you've asked lots of questions. So we're gonna take a look and see if we have any questions. We don't have any questions right now, but um, you can go back in the comments and reply to any of questions that might come in later. Okay. Uh, yep. We'd love to do that actually. All right. So write in those questions. Yep, thank you, Leslie. Okay.